What's going on, guys? Thanks for tuning in to today's show. Have a very interesting conversation for you today where I welcome Dr. Helen Fisher. And Dr. Helen Fisher is a biological anthropologist, senior research fellow at the Kinsey Institute, and chief scientific advisor at Match.com. And she has conducted extensive research and written six books on the evolution and future of human sex, love, marriage, gender differences in the brain, and how your personality style shapes who you are and who you love. And today, Dr. Fisher and I dive into just that how we become who we are and how that shows up in relationships and how our biology is important to understand in the context of relationships. And I really enjoyed this conversation because most of our guests are coming from a psychology background where we're really diving into the family dynamics and and attachment styles and, and communication and those things are super important, and it's not to discount them, as uh, Dr. Fisher will tell you, and you'll hear her say, but taking the biological approach of sex is good for you, just on a biological level. So sometimes, rather than trying to hash out the argument about who should take out the trash for the 10th time, and there's ways and tools to do that better, but maybe you guys just need to have a good date night and have sex and hack our biology because that's going to connect you on a on a deeper biological level through endorphins and brain chemicals. So I really enjoyed this conversation in this different perspective with Helen. Thanks so much for tuning in and I hope you guys enjoy today's show. Hi, Helen. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today. I'm delighted to be with you. Today, we are going to talk about your role with Match.com and the 11th Annual Singles in America study. But I thought a great place to start would be having you tell our listeners a little bit about your work in the field of human sex, love, marriage, and gender differences, and how you came to be with Match.com, and then we'll jump into the study. Great. Well, let's see. I'm I'm a biological anthropologist. I got my PhD in human evolution, and I wrote my PhD dissertation on why it is that men and women form partnerships, why we are monogamous, why we pair up to rear our young. 97% of mammals do not do that. Uh, people do. So uh, it's a real question. Uh, so anyway, I, I came up with um, a theory of, uh, you know, the trees were disappearing. Uh, we had to get out. Uh, we began to stand up on two feet instead of four. Uh, women's had to carry their babies in their arms instead of on their backs. Uh, they began to need a partner to help them, at least while the child was in infancy and suckling. So um, I, I then moved on to study the brain circuitry of romantic love. I and my colleagues are the first in the world to put people in brain scanners and study the brain circuitry of romantic love and attachment. And anyway, I've written six books on it. <laughs> Most recent one is uh, Anatomy of Love, second edition. and. Um, one day, two days before Christmas, um, I got a telephone call. I live in New York City and it was Match.com. And they asked me, would I come in uh, two days after Christmas and talk with them? And I said, well, sure. I mean, nothing happens at Christmas in New York. So anyway, I did it. And all these people filed in the room. I And finally, I, I didn't know who they were. But I was the CEO on down. And in the middle of the morning, they said, why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? And I spent uh, several years uh, uh, working on that. I mean, we do tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic background, same general level of intelligence and good looks and education. Uh, your childhood always plays a role, your values, your goals, et cetera. But you can walk into a room and everybody is from your background and level of intelligence and good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So that steered me into studying the biology of personality and why we are naturally drawn, biologically drawn to some people rather than others. So that was first the thing that I did with Match. And then now this Singles in America study. Uh, what we do is I create with my colleagues about 200 questions every year. And we farm them out to a very good service. We collect the data, 
on all Americans. We do not poll the match members. This is a national representative sample of singles based on the U.S. census. So this is year number 11. We did it right in the middle of the pandemic, and there's some remarkable findings. I definitely want to dive into those findings. But before we get into that, can we talk a little bit about why we fall in love with one person over another in some of the research you did there? And maybe you can share some of the more surprising or counter to what we might think the reasons would be for us falling in love, the findings that you found? Sure. You know, I'm a biological. I mean, there's all kinds of cultural reasons that you fall for one person. As I mentioned, we do tend to fall in love with somebody from the same ethnic and socioeconomic background, same general level of good looks, education and intelligence, people who share our religious and social values, uh, uh, people who have the same economic goals and reproductive goals. Your childhood always plays a role. But as I said, you know, you can run into an awful lot of people with all of those similarities and you don't fall in love with all of them. So that began to think, okay, well, you know, people will say we have chemistry or we don't have chemistry. What could be happening here? So anyway, I started to look through all of the biological literature for any trait at all linked with any biological system. So there's all kinds of systems in the brain. Most of them keep the heart beating or the eyes blinking. They don't link with any personality traits, but there are four brain systems that is each one of these brain systems is linked with a whole suite, a constellation, a clump of personality traits, the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen system. So um, I created a questionnaire to see to what degree you express the traits in each of these four systems. And I was able to find the following. People who are very, now we all express all of these systems. That's one of the problems with all of these personality questionnaires. They put you in one bucket or another. That's not the way the brain is built. But we, we, exp we express some traits in all four of these systems. Anyway, the bottom line is people who are very primarily expressive of the traits in the dopamine system. I call them explorers. They tend to be novelty seeking, risk taking, curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic, mentally flexible people. And they're drawn to people like themselves. Over 15 million people have put my questionnaire um, on some of their sites in 40 countries. So I've got data on over 15 million people. Anyway, people I call explorers, uh, risk-taking, novelty-seeking, creative people go for people like themselves. People who are very expressive of the traits in the serotonin system, I call them builders. You could call them guardians. That's what uh, Plato called them. These people, they are traditional, conventional. They follow the rules. They respect authority. They're detail-oriented, not big theory people. They tend to be religious. Uh, they're very conscientious. Um, they're loyal. Loyalty is very important to them. And they are also drawn to people like themselves. I think Mitt Romney is a very good example. I think uh, Mike Pence is a good example. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is very much of the high serotonin uh, a guardian type. They're also drawn to people like themselves. In those two cases, uh, similarity attracts. In the other two cases, the opposites attract. High testosterone goes for high estrogen and vice versa. Uh, high testosterone people, uh, I call them directors. They tend to be analytical, logical, direct, decisive, tough-minded, good at things like math or engineering or computers or mechanics. They tend to be very competitive, rank-oriented, and they're drawn to their opposite. I call them directors. They're drawn to uh, high estrogen, which is negotiators. These are people who are high estrogen. It can be men as well as women. They tend to be empathetic. They're really, they, they, they see the big picture. I call it web thinking. They're long-term, holistic, uh, um, contextual thinkers. They're very good at reading posture, gesture, tone of voice. They're very trusting. They can be very trusting, empathetic, and compassionate. And they are drawn to high testosterone. So um, uh, I'll give me as an example. Uh, both my husband and I are very high dopamine. He's a writer the way I am and a public speaker the way I am. He's traveled all over the world the way I have. We both love um, excitement and we're both curious and hopefully creative. Um, so we're very similar in that way and that works. But he is very high on the testosterone scale and I'm very high on the estrogen scale. That also works. He's analytical, logical. I'm, I'm pretty logical too, but uh, he's, he's a techie. 
and I'm not at all. I mean, I could get lost in the bathtub. It's ridiculous. But uh, and I'm very high estrogen, so that works well too. But I know that you're in this business of having people understand themselves and hand it uh, and understand their relationship. So I'm going into this because so he's different than I am in that he's higher serotonin. He's higher, more of a builder than I am. He follows the rules. He respects authority under a lot of circumstances. Whereas I, I'll follow the rules if they make sense to me, uh, but I, I don't follow them just because they're a rule. And uh, a good example of this was we were once going to the movies and I said, sweetheart, do you have any water in your backpack? He said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, we could we could uh, drink that in the movie house. He said, no, we can't. You can't bring food or drink into the movie house. <laughs> you have to bring it, buy it at the concession stand. Well, I mean, there's an example of he's just different. I mean, we are so saturated these days in psychology. Everything is a problem with your childhood. Everything is a problem with your with your experiences. Yes, there are problems. Childhood and your experiences can create problems, but they don't create all your problems. Some of it is you're just who you are. Some people are more stubborn. Some people are more sensitive to criticism. Some people are more joyous. Some people are more analytical. Some people are better at singing and dancing. Some people are better at shooting a basket in basketball. Some people are more creative, curious, et cetera, et cetera. And it has nothing to do with whether you're black, white, Asian, Latino, gay, straight, uh, uh, what part of the world you live in, et cetera. These are basic brain systems that naturally draw you to certain people rather than others. And I wrote a whole book on it called Why Him, Why Her? And what I hope that it shows people is that we are, I mean, you can pick up a million self books about, about your problems that stem from your childhood. This is a book about who you really are, the other part of you, who you who you were born to be, uh, and um, and uh, how you're naturally drawn to some people rather than others. How can our listeners think about these things of who we are comes from our childhood, or we just might be stubborn? And let's say someone listening is thinking that their partner is stubborn. And obviously that can create issues if they, they're digging their heels in and they just want to be right, they can't admit they're wrong. How can people frame that in the context of their relationships in a positive way in that I believe people can change. So obviously maybe we're innately a bit stubborn, maybe it comes from childhood a little bit, but it shows up negatively in the relationship. How do you think about that in talking to people to turn things positively and, and make it work for them? Well, it's a, Chase, it's a very good question because first of all, we can change. To some extent, we can change. We can act out of character. We begin in small childhood when our parents say, well, smile for grandma and you don't feel like smiling, but you do it anyway. We do learn, we stretch, um, we can change, but it's tiring. And so a person who is stubborn can learn to be less stubborn, but will they ever be as mentally flexible as somebody who's not at all stubborn? Probably not. They will always see that there's that's a part of them. Let me give you an example of exactly this. I was making a speech. I make a speech to a lot of couples therapists. And this was a woman. She was listening in the audience. She said, you know, Helen, um, you know, both uh, my husband and I are very high on dopamine. We're explorers. We love to go hiking. Um, but he is higher on serotonin than I am. He's more of a builder. He doesn't really like change. It makes him uncomfortable. And there was one Thanksgiving and what I decided, I wanted to make a change in the stuffing to put into the turkey. And I suggested that we put in some sausage. Well, as she said to me, it turned into a royal battle. <laughs> he couldn't change. And finally, he looked at me, he started to smile, he threw up his hands and he said, let's go hiking. So basically, they came to a, an impasse. It wasn't going to be solved. So they changed directions and chose something that they both understand about each other and do together. So one of the things that I think is, I mean, take my questionnaire. It's called the Fisher Temperament Inventory. You can get it all over the Internet. You could get it from almost any of my books. I would go to my website, uh, um, uh, helenfisher.com or my other one, theanatomyoflove.com, 
and you could take the questionnaire and get, you get an understanding of who you are and you get an understanding of who your partner is and you begin to realize this is not about you. They're not stubborn because of you. They're stubborn because it's who they are. They can change to some extent, but what you've got to begin to do is do a workaround. Um, you don't need 15 years of therapy to, to figure out who you are, or who you aren't, and how to do a workaround. So with my husband, I said to him, I said, well, okay, let's let's buy water at the concession stand. What the hell? So um, you begin to really understand who somebody is, who they aren't, how much they can change. Do they want to change? That's a different question. Uh, if somebody doesn't want to change, now then you got a problem because then it is about you. Then it is about the fact that uh, they're not willing to make some stretch themselves a little to accommodate uh, to the relationship. Then you got to have a discussion about why they won't change. But the bottom line is we are who we are. We change to some extent. We can do workarounds. And when we do, you can just throw up your hands and laugh and say, okay, let's just go hiking. I love that example. And easier said than done, like a lot of the things we talk about on this show, but it's so powerful to have that because a, a lot of times we talk about the tools and how to solve things and how to communicate and kind of tools to to hack into the system of the relationship and, and make things kind of compatible. But that example you gave of like, okay, we're at an impasse. Let's go hiking. It's like, it, it's a tool, <laughs> but it's like, we're just going to leave this thing over here that we're disagreeing on and agree to disagree to an extent or agree that, Hey, you're a different person. I'm not going to change you. That's who you are. And let's go hiking. This is something we could connect on. I think that's, it's simple, powerful, hard to do, but really important. Can you talk a little bit more about other workarounds that, that people can think about so that we're not just always going, okay, let's just ignore that and, and, and go hiking to an extent. Thanks for your appreciation for, of this, because it is a very different view and it is based on biology instead of psychology in your childhood. But there are big issues. I mean, the things that people, the big things that people fight about are, are money, uh, children, uh, sex, um, in-laws. There's a fifth that I can't seem to remember. Maybe you know it. Um, and those things are very difficult because um, something like money, and if somebody's a spendthrift and Others, others a miser, um, it permeates the whole relationship. It's not just about, you know, some stuffing in a turkey or, or children. And um, I think what you might have to do is, well, I'd love it if they took my questionnaire so that they understood why they have these different uh, perspectives. Uh, I'm not against psychology. I mean, I do think that there's an awful lot of good therapists who could work on the big issues and say, well, look, uh, can you find a third way? You know, one person doesn't ever want to discipline the child and the other disciplines the child too much. Can we find a, something that we can both agree on? Uh, um, can we look at the other alternatives to to this uh, and, uh, and find a, a way around? The bottom line here, Chase, is that... Uh, Relationships are really, really important. Um, a good relationship, an, an article came out um, a few months ago that showed that if you're in a good relationship, um, uh, it slows the aging process and you're likely to live five to seven years longer. Uh, a good relationship also, you reduce uh, cholesterol and cortisol, the stress hormone. Uh, when you hug somebody, you're driving up oxytocin, giving, giving feelings of attachment. As you laugh with somebody, you're driving up the dopamine system, which gives you optimism and um, focus and motivation and energy. And as you play with something, it it, 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 it helps with brain growth in areas uh, associated with decision-making and processing of information. So good relationships are worth remembering. It's worth remembering. We don't have to fight on about whether this child goes to bed at 8 or 8.30. We've got something more important. The most important thing for a child is that the parents get along. Um, and so if you can think of what's really important to yourselves, um, you know, maybe you can 
do that kind of work around. Sex is another one. I mean, people really fight about sex. And unfortunately, some people, they use it as a as a weapon. You know, I'm not going to have sex with you because you insulted me yesterday. Uh, or, you know, um, I'm always, you're always tired and, um, and I feel rejected. These are big problems. And you certainly can go to sex therapists and regular therapists to solve them. But, you know, I think a lot of therapists, I mean, are going to help you get to the root of the problem. But um, I would just add as a biological anthropologist that sex is good for you. And bringing that weapon into a, a partnership can be lethal. So I'd steer clear of that. And there's lots of times when we do things for other people that we don't really feel like doing, <laughs> but we do them for something important, which is the relationship. Before we continue on, we're going to tell you about today's sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Nowadays, it is definitely okay to talk about our mental health and happiness. We are not meant to keep everything inside, and therapy truly helps. But what is therapy exactly? Well, it is whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're struggling in your relationship, or maybe you are super happy, but you want to be proactive in your relationship and look for some tools that might help you in the future. Or maybe you just feel overwhelmed with life and need someone to talk to. Whatever you need, don't be ashamed of normal human struggles. And start feeling better today, because you deserve to feel happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really all about. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash I do. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash I do. Today's episode is brought to you by Bonafide. Bonafide offers naturally derived products to treat menopause, PMS, and intimacy issues. It's easy to use, safe, hormone-free, and recommended by thousands of doctors. Bonafide believes you deserve relief without compromise, so they've spent years researching and testing the purest ingredients to create safe and effective solutions. If you're experiencing symptoms related to premenopause, menopause, postmenopause, or even intimacy issues, I want to tell you a little bit about how Bonafide's products can help you. One of their products, called Reverie, provides powerful hormone-free relief from vaginal dryness with an easy-to-use vaginal insert that renews your body's moisture for everyday comfort and intimacy. Another one of their products is Serenol, which provides relief from emotional PMS symptoms, including mood swings, irritability, and uneasiness. And if you're starting to experience menopause, hot flashes, and night sweats, Relizin will help you stay cool and dry all day and night. They also offer a product called Ristella that supports sexually active women who want to enhance their response to sexual stimulation by increasing orgasms and sexual arousal. Give Bonafide a try today. No hormones and no prescription required. Real relief without compromise. To get 20% off your first purchase when you subscribe to any product, go to hellobonafide.com and use the promo code I do. That's hellobonafide, B O N A F I D E.com and use the code I D O. That's I do for 20% off at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to you by Foria. Better sex starts with Foria. People may not think they need that little extra help in the bedroom, but I was pleasantly surprised by how much better and more pleasurable my sexual experiences are when I use Foria. Foria is using all natural and plant based ingredients to intensify sexual pleasure and relieve discomfort. Foria makes products that will transform your sexual pleasure. Foria's products are made to help women and people with vulvas fully experience their sexual pleasure, from heightened orgasms to more sexual comfort. Foria's bestseller, the Awaken Arousal Oil, is the ultimate pleasure pregame. 
The arousal awaken oil is like a juicy warm up that helps you get really turned on, increasing your pleasure and deepening your orgasms with a partner or even solo. Awaken uses CBD and warming sensation inducing organic botanicals that enhance arousal, sensitivity, pleasure, access to orgasms, and helps relieve any discomfort. Best of all, Awaken just turns you on. And my favorite combo is to use Foria's Awaken Arousal Oil and the Sex Oil for a perfect combo for peak pleasure. So yes, you have my permission to try this. I fully endorse you to go ahead and treat yourself to more deeper, fuller pleasure whenever you can find it as often as possible, and you can start with a bottle of Foria. Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting foriawellness.com slash I do, or use the code I do at checkout. That's Foria, F-O-R-I-A, wellness.com forward slash I do for 20% off your first order. I recommend trying their Awaken Arousal Oil and their sex oil. You will thank me later. Today's episode is also brought to you by Swell. Social media can feel pretty toxic these days. People are spreading misinformation, posting those oh-so-perfect portrayals of their lives, and on top of it all, you're bombarded with ads. Well, luckily, Swell is changing the social game. Swell is a voice-based social platform where you can have and host conversations with people all over the world on your own time. You're listening to this podcast, so you obviously know the power of audio. People become much more real and authentic when you're able to hear the tone and emotion that's coming behind from what they're saying. On Swell, you can broadcast your voice to ask a question, share an opinion, or just tell a funny story and connect with a diverse array of people. You can also listen to others talk about their experience or thoughts on a topic that interests you. If you enjoy listening to podcasts like this one, then you'll love all the compelling voices and content on Swell. They have stations on mental health, real life stories, pop culture, and more. And now you can download the Swell app for free on the App Store or the Play Store or by visiting swell.life slash podcast. Again, you can download the Swell app. That's Swell, S-W-E-L-L by going to swell.life slash podcast. And the link is also in our episode description. Swell. Keep talking. I love the biological perspective you're bringing and want to go back to the let's go hiking because I think of another kind of workaround as an example would be, okay, you're having a disagreement. You guys are at an impasse instead of ironing it out or trying to identify your needs. And those things have been covered on this podcast a lot and and they are important. I'm not trying to overwrite it, just as you said. However, there can be a lot of value in saying, okay, we're disagreeing here. Why don't we go out to dinner tonight, listen to some music, have some drinks, have fun. We haven't done that in the last month. And that a lot of times is probably what you need. I completely agree with you. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I, you know, I, I, neither of us want to dump on psychology. There's a lot there. But, you know, a good 40 to 60 percent of who you are does come from your biology. I mean, we are we have what the, you know, per, uh, 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 you know, uh, what they call temperament dimensions. In other words, I mean, some people are born more curious. Uh, some people are born more stubborn. Some people are m- born more analytical. Some people are born more compassionate. And uh, and when you understand who your partner really is and that this is not just all about you, <laughs> you can find these workarounds. And it's as well with it's well with doing. I mean, nobody gets out of love alive. We all suffer. Uh, making a good relationship is, I think, paramount to human health. And once you begin to see the big picture, sure, go out for dinner. I mean, and go do something novel together. Novelty drives up the dopamine system in the brain and can push you uh, back over the threshold into falling in love. So you, what you really want to do in a relationship is um, uh, really keep all three basic brain systems alive. We've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. Sex drive, feelings of intense romantic love, and feelings of deep attachment. 
And in most good relationships, uh, people keep all three of them alive. So if you want to keep romantic love alive, go do novel things together. Novelty, novelty, novelty. What you really want to do is make sure that you um, keep all three of the basic brain systems for love alive. We've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for for uh, mating and reproduction. One is a sex drive. Second is feelings of intense romantic love. And third is feelings of deep attachment. And if you want to keep the sex drive alive, have sex. It drives up the, the testosterone system, makes you want to have more sex. So the less you have, the less you want. The more you have, the more you want. It's basic physiology. And people say, well, I don't have time. Well, they got time to go to the, go to the movies. They got time to see their friends. You, you have time. <laughs> Even if you just set it up and put it on a calendar, you have time. You can find a time. And sex is very good for the body and the mind. But anyway, if you want to sustain feelings of intense romantic love, do novel things together. Novelty, novelty, novelty. Um, and I don't mean swinging from chandeliers. I mean... I mean, you know, ride your bikes to a, your dinner at night or, or take a walk on Saturday instead of working or, um, you know, go someplace new in the summer instead of the same old place. See some new friends, read some new books together, cook something new together. Novelty drives up the dopamine system and can help sustain feelings or push you over into feelings of romantic love. And if you want to uh, sustain feelings of deep attachment, stay in touch. Um, you know, just walk arm in arm, uh, kiss. Uh, um, uh, when you actually orgasm, uh, it gives you a flood of oxytocin and gives you those feelings of deep attachment. So um, um, get rid of the two armchairs and sit next to each other on the couch when you watch television. Any kind of touch, nice touch drives up the dopam- the oxytocin system in the brain and can sustain feelings of attachment. So you want to keep all three of those brain systems alive, sex drive, romantic love, and attachment. And curiously, um, well, we looked and we, we put people who were in long-term happy partnerships into the brain scanner. These were people who came into the lab and said, I'm still in love with her, not just loving, but in love with him or her. Americans don't believe you can remain in love. So we put them in the scanner, uh, brain scanner, fMRI, and we were able to find, sure enough, this basic brain regions for romantic love became active. These are, these are people who were all married uh, 21 years. But we also found activity in three brain regions linked with long-term happiness. A brain region linked with empathy, a brain region linked with controlling your own stress and your own emotions, and a brain region linked with what we call positive illusions, the ability to overlook what you don't like about somebody and focus on what you do. I do that all the time. I mean, there's some little things that can annoy you about somebody, and I think, well, you know, that's annoying, but God, they're so funny. Geez, he's so generous. Oh, he loves to do new things with me, et cetera, et cetera. Focus on the positive. There's ways to stay happy, but you do have to pick the right person. <laughs> People don't change that much. You got to pick the right person. Wow. So much in there that I really love that brain scan. And I want to just touch on the, the positive illusions and how powerful that can be. Because to me, that's tied in to expectations too. It's like if you expect your partner to be perfect all the time, and then you're going to focus on when they're not perfect. And instead of the positive attributes, I think it's so easy for us to to fall into that pattern rather than kind of the opposite of, okay, yeah, they did that, but I love this instead of like, they're nice, but they did this bad thing, right? And that becomes the focus. Yeah. The brain is built to remember the bad. We've got a huge brain region linked with what they call negativity bias. We remember the bad. And uh, for millions of years, that was adaptive because it's nice to remember who your friends are. But if you forget who your enemies are, you can die. So we remember the bad. This is one of the problems in dating. You you know, when, uh, you know, I worked with Match for 16 years now. And one of the problems, there's a lot that's great about this stuff. And by the way, these aren't even dating sites. All they are is introducing sites. It's all they do is introduce you. It's remarkable that people go on to think that they're going to change the brain. All they do is introduce you to people. But the bottom line is 
when you first meet somebody, you don't know very much about them. And so you can think, oh, well, he likes cats. I like dogs. It'll never work. They're focusing on the negative, you know, instead of saying, oh, geez, he was really funny. Oh, God, he was sort of cute and da 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 da. So, yeah, that's something the human brain, you got to watch out for your own brain. It's going to tell you what's wrong with everybody. (laughs) And you got to focus on what's right. I love that, Helen. And before we wrap up, because I could just talk to you all about your research and, and the biological side, but I, I do want to touch on the study from Match.com. You guys have been doing it 11 years. Can you just quickly share kind of what the goal is and, and what you guys find and how our listeners might be able to apply some of the findings? Absolutely. Well, we've done it for 11 years. Um, it's called Singles in America. Um, in the middle of the summer, generally, sometimes other times, uh, we can uh, we um, cook up about 200 questions that we want to know the answer to. Um, we give it to the people who are very good at polling, very good at polling. If we do not poll match members. This is a national representative sample of singles based on the U.S. Census. And every year we collect data on over 5,000 singles, every background, every walk of life, every, every, et cetera. And this year we did it in the middle of COVID. And I have, ne- Chase, I've never used this word before in my things. It was historic. What we found was historic. And the reason what we found is what, what, what I'm, I'm calling the post-traumatic growth. Singles of all ages and all backgrounds have grown up. Um, they're far less interested in casual sex. They're much more interested in finding a long-term uh, partnership. They are particularly interested in somebody who's emotionally mature. Um, they're having, um, uh, they're, they're doing this uh, video dating now. One out of four is, is video dating. And one out of two of, of Gen Z and millennials, the young, are doing video dating. And what they're doing on these video dates is they're spending more time getting to know the person before they meet in person. They're having more meaningful conversations. They're having more honesty and transparency, more self-disclosure, and that's men as well as women. They're much more interested in somebody who has, is fully employed and is um, financially stable, much less interested in looks and more interested in marriage. It's quite remarkable. You know, I've got data on 11 years, so we can compare before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And so we looked this year at people and their responses to some questions in 2019, that's right before the pandemic, and then 2021, right after it. And what they uh, want now is actually a, a partner, a real partner, somebody who has uh, has the same degree of income, uh, who has the same level of education, uh, who is um, successful, has a successful career, not just a job, but a successful career. And the most interesting thing that I found in this whole thing was when we asked the question this year, um, do you want a partner who wants to marry? And two years ago, before the pandemic, 58% of singles said, yes, I want a partner who wants to marry. This year, 76%, an 18% rise. People want to settle down and they want to settle down within the next year. And men and millennials are leading the way. Men are more inclined to want to settle down uh, than women are. They feel the emotional connection faster. We've always known that. Um, and so that that's number one, that, uh, I mean, real post-traumatic growth. Singles are, and they're also caring for their mental health and their uh, physical health. They're saying they're, they're better at relaxing, they're getting more sleep, uh, they're better at managing their money and their time. It's a time of remarkable um, reset uh, among singles of what they're looking for right now. Bad boy, bad girl are out. Um, stability is what is sexy today. That's number one. Number two, they have taken this um, this um, pandemic more seriously. I, I, last time we looked, uh, 73% of singles had um, gotten vaccinated as opposed to 64% of the general public. Now that may have changed a little bit in the uh, more recently, but this was a few weeks ago that we took that study. But the bottom line is today, um, 58% of singles will not have sex with somebody who's not vaccinated. Uh, 54% will not start a romance 
uh, with somebody who's not vaccinated, 52%, that's over half, would not even go out on a first date with somebody who's not vaccinated, and 48% regard uh, people um, who are not vaccinated as selfish. Nobody wants somebody who's selfish. So, you know, if you want romance, get vaccinated. This is your ticket to love. Um, and what I'm really seeing, I've written about this a lot. I call it slow love. Love is slowing down. 50 years ago, people, singles got married in their early 20s. Now they're getting married in their late 20s. This long period of pre-commitment. Singles are learning more about themselves. They're getting rid of what they don't want. They've invented all these terms like um, DTR, define the relationship. They want to know what's going on. It's a, I'm crazy about the young. I don't know how old you are, but I'm crazy about the young. They're actually very dedicated, very serious, really thinking about their career, want to get this thing right. And what this pandemic has done has made them even more serious. Uh, slow love is slowing down. They're looking for the right kinds of things now in partnerships. They're expressing this post-traumatic growth. And we really may see a few decades of relative family stability as these singles begin to marry. It is certainly fascinating how the pandemic has changed a lot of areas of our life. And you're seeing that with your survey, certainly. And it will take years for it all to shake out and see where we're at. But it's definitely interesting to see people shift and wanting that stability, maybe a shift to less uh, hedonistic tendencies and just flings and kind of living life on the edge and more like, hey, I want some stability because the world's a little crazy and I, I want to feel secure at home. It, to me, that's that's what I think of with the results that you're seeing. So we'll have to have you back on for, you know, the 14th annual survey and see where <laughs> we're at. Um, and to just talk about all the, the interesting work you've done in, in the research. And I think we covered a lot today, Helen, and I really appreciate your perspective. I was a uh, anthropology major myself. I didn't oh, go into mm -hmm. the field or anything, but I just studied it because I, I think it's so fascinating to take a holistic look at uh, how we are who we are in all the different areas. And, and obviously, we're just focusing on a, a tiny area of anthropology, but I certainly appreciate all the work you've done in the field and all the information you've shared with our listeners today. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. I, I really appreciate it and happy holidays to you. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. As always, all the links to the guest as well as any of their recommendations will be in the show notes page. You can find the link to that in the episode description or by going to idopodcast.com. Click on the podcast tab up at the top and you will have access to all the episodes that we've ever done. There are over 300 of them. Uh, and while you're on our website, if you haven't checked out our free 14 day happy couple challenge, we really hope you do. It's a free email challenge that we send to you. It's 14 days of fun, easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And if you're looking for something that provides a little more help with working on your relationship, whether it's improving intimacy or communication with your partner or just bringing the spark back, we would love for you guys to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. We're offering $100 off to all of our listeners if you go to sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. We've worked with over 15 psychologists and therapists to create the real life tools and strategies that they are teaching their clients. So we wanted to give them to you. It's a self-paced online course that can be done in as little as a month or up to three months. You can really decide how much or how little you want to do with your partner or maybe just yourself. So we hope you guys check that out. It's sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. Have a great day.